Whilst my esteemed guests are getting seated and comfortable, firstly, I'd like to welcome you uh, to the British Library on a sweltering July evening. I'd like to check my time because when we say sweltering and heat and weather and sun in the UK, it's a fleeting thing, so I just have to check my watch. Um, I also want to welcome all our listeners online because this has been streamed live. Uh, yes, it's very cool. Thank you. And a short backstory. Um, my name is Michael Riley. Um, I'm, to you guys, I'm Associate Professor Michael Riley at the University of Westminster, where I've set up the Black Music Research, which triggered this exhibition here at the library, Beyond the Baseline, which is also curated by my colleague, lead curator here at the library, Alima Gray. This evening is particularly exciting um, because of our guests. This is a history of UK music in itself. If you, how many of you have seen the exhibition? Just curious. <coughs> Thank you. Can you slap all the people next to you that haven't seen the exhibition? <laughs> only joking, no violence. Um, we only have four weeks left of the exhibition, so please go and see it. The exhibition Beyond the Baseline is looking at 500 years of black music in the UK. What that means is we predate black music in the UK. Got that wrong. We predate black music in America. Think about that. Um, with that said, <clears throat> I'm going to hand over to Glenn, who's going to introduce the panel. Um, I'm going to step off stage. But feel free to start composing your questions now. I'm sure you're going to have lots of them. Uh, the panel looked about right. Um, here we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Very kind. And welcome everybody here and welcome everybody that's online. We're going to have a discussion about songwriting and songs. And uh, like Michael said, we're going to have a discussion with the, uh, with the panel here. So prepare questions. And those of you who are online, you can submit questions in a, que in a question box on the platform that you're watching. So um, at the end, we'll, we'll, we'll take questions and hopefully have um, more interesting discussions for you. So just by way of introduction, so my name is Glyn. I am the co-president of RCA Records in the, in the UK. And with us, my esteemed colleagues on the panel here, we have, at the end there, we have Cesaro Agor. And Cesaro is an award-winning composer, producer, and writer. Uh, um, so it says here, your sound combines elements of Afro-folk, soul, pop, Indian, jazz. You're a graduate of philosophy and languages and has a musical called The Garden in development. In short, you also compose bespoke scores for TV and film and songs in Spanish. And your latest EP, uh, Shadows and Searchlights, is out now. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Wonderful, all wonderful. welcome. welcome. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then next to, to Shazara is uh, Shazne Lewis. Uh, and she, it's, uh, and just go with me. This is the, these are the notes I've been given. But, um, <laughs> um, Living <but>, icon. <laughs> <laughs> It's probably, yeah, it's probably, that's probably enough said. Yeah. <laughs> but no, but Shazna, you founded the, the, the legendary British girl group, All Saints, in, 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 in 1993. Oh. Is, that, is that correct? Yeah. Right, cool. yeah. Funny, it's a story. It's, like, it's one of my favourite years of music. And when I, I started a label six years ago, and I called it Since 93, because oh, really? my favourite music oh, wow. came out in 1993. Oh. So there you go. Mm. <laughs> so, but no, no, but you also, uh, you have an, an Ivan Novello Award, two Brit Awards, and a MOBO. Um, and your latest album, Pages, was released this year and features contributions from General Levy and Shola Amma. Yeah. No, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Presumably streaming on all platforms now. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. So you know what to do. Thank 
you. Right. And then the next to Shaz, now we have uh, Wretch 3-2. Now, Wretch is a British rapper who rose out of Tottenham, along with peers like Chipmunk and Skepta. And in the latter half of the 2000s, he joined Graham Collective's Combination Chain Gang and The Movement, and also put out solo efforts as mixtapes. Uh, you were signed to a label called Levels, which was part of Ministry of Sound, mm -hmm. founded by our dearly departed friend, Mr. Richard Anthony. Richard Anthony, Westy Soul. Westy Soul, yes. Um, and, by the, and, uh, and that was in the early 2000s, but by the decade's end, your, your first major single, Tractor, was released in January 2011 and debuted at number five on the UK charts. <laughs> But beyond that, beyond that, beyond that, beyond that string of, <laughs> but beyond that, a string of hits, singles including "Unorthodox," "Don't Go," "Blackout," "Into," six words. Your third album, "Growing Over Life," was commended by critics and for, and, uh, for some of the most honest lyrics and deepest narratives yet. Um, your next album, "Fr 32 featured guest performances from the likes of Koji Radical, Avelino, and Kojo Funds. And your latest EP, Moments of Silence, was released this year to critical acclaim. Congratulations. <laughs> now, and then, so, so now next to me is, uh, is, is Mr. Ebony K. Uh, Ebony K. I feel, like, I, feel like you don't need, I feel like you don't need an introduction. <laughs> um, You'll be nice. No, no, no. no, no. I, have, I, have, I, have, I have the notes. Okay. Uh, but uh, you are a, a Grammy Award winning Brit and, Ivan, a Brit and Ivan Avello nominated artist, producer, and writer who has written with the likes of Zara Larson, Stormzy, Craig David, Beyonce, Little Mix, Dua Lipa, Kelly Rowland, mm -hmm. Christine Aguilera, just to name a few. <laughs> You enjoyed, you, you, enjoyed, you enjoyed global success with your single, Head and Heart, uh, topping the charts in several countries and taking the reign as the longest standing UK number one single in 2020. Uh, in the recent years, you've continued success ex ex executively producing Flo's debut EP, The Lead. You considered a musical icon amongst the LGBTQIA plus community and has previously performed at New York World Pride, UK Black Pride, and featured on New Pro, uh, RuPaul's Drag Race. No, no. Uh, and you've continued your efforts to strive for more. No, no. I was like, when is it going to end? No, no, no. <laughs> It's like a lot. You love it. You, love it. I mean, you did say it would be nice to have an issue. It's OK, no, I'll, I'll save your blushing. OK. So, you don't blush, we so, get warm. <laughs> For goodness sake. <laughs> so, right. So, um, so, just opening up this discussion here, do you want to start with just to, to ask some initial reactions from the, um, the exhibition? Like how, how did it make you feel? Um, and what parts of the exhibitions um, stood out to you? We'll start with uh, we we'll start with you. I need to stay in here with the <laughs> We'll start with you. Yes. Um, I think we don't get a lot of opportunities to walk into a space and feel like we see the breadth of our history laid out in front of us. And I know that this is only like a small amount that we're getting to see, but there is something about reminding ourselves about the cycles that we have undertaken, especially in music and politics and history, and know that there are people that before us had faced similar issues and how they surmounted that or how we continue to surmount that. Um, and so it was such a great pleasure to relive that and try and imagine that we could have been there. We are the same people. We have that lineage and that connection. And that's incredible, and I just want to remind everyone of it all the time and remind myself of it so when I'm making things, I don't need to be saying, I was the first to do this. I, was, I can say, actually, take it back to the 1500s. Mm -hmm. There was this person doing that. There were clubs. There was community. There was, we can do that. It's not something alien to us. Um, and I think right now, as we become more and more fractured, having something like this is so powerful as a reminder of what we are capable of mm. and what we can continue to build. That's how I felt about. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, Wretch, <laughs> over to you, sir. 
Yeah, I'm. Um, to be honest, I'm yet to, I'm yet to experience it. But I'm, I've got to come back with the kids, man. I've got a tribe now, so I mm-hmm. need them to like, really understand where we're coming from for them to know where, where they're going mm-hmm. and, and what their potential can be. So um, yeah. Wonderful. You sure it's nice? Same. I wish I'd said it before you. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, so actually, but I mean, I was given some insight before we came out, and actually, I am waiting to be taken on a tour. Same thing with the children. Okay. But actually, drawing on some of what you said has made me even more excited to see it. So, yeah. Oh, wonderful. And Emily K. Well, you know, I think that. Definitely because, you know, black British music has such legacy Mm. and, you know, we're all, everyone on the stage has played a massive part of black British music. Mm. And yet there's not always the place to see the source and to see even further than just the past 20, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. So when I saw 500 years, I was like, whoa, okay, that's even further back than I can even... Imagine. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. exactly. So... It was great to see just, like Chisara was saying, just like how there's been so much that's been done and nothing is new under the sun, but there's power in that, you know yeah. what I mean? It's not this thing that people always put so much on being the first to do it, and all, but it's like, it's great that there's foundation, that there's like a, a roadmap almost, yeah. like a trail. Yeah. Um, I loved it. Great, great, yeah. I mean, I think for me, it's, it was, it's the, we've always had, we've had various discussions <coughs> with people about the fact that the sort of the history of, of, of black British music is never really documented. Properly. No, uh, because right? really, I suppose my, I don't know about you guys, mm-hmm. but I would be thinking more on the American side of black music. Definitely. That's how far back mm-hmm. I'd be trying to mm-hmm. go. So actually, I think it will actually add a new narrative even to myself personally as a writer just experiencing going back that far. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and the other thing that's, that that, uh, that was stuck with me is is just about the sort of the power <coughs> of influence on popular culture from that far yeah. from that far back, and it's just something that we don't we're just not aware of no. at all. Mm-hmm. So for those who haven't seen the um, if you haven't seen the, uh, the the exhibition, I urge you and strongly encourage you to see it because it's a, it's a, it's a history that you should you should all all be aware of mm-hmm. on there. Right, so. Talking about you know person more sort of personal experiences in the <coughs> bless you that was a bit loud sorry guys <laughs> <laughs> the mic just doesn't help <laughs> um, so sorry so talking about more formative years <laughs> <laughs> uh, and sort of delving into things with more personal stories and, and journeys into into music to, for the you know when you think about all the things that you're doing and you've, and you've done. So I wanted to just talk quickly about, you know, um, a song that perhaps changed things for you and, what you, and made you um, and made you want to make make music. Um, and I think, you know, you made some selections earlier, and I think we can play a couple of the songs and then get into really get into discussion about what those songs uh, meant for you. So I'll start with you, Rich. What was the uh, the, the the song that changed things for you? I think. For me, it was a record called Can't Be Life by Jay-Z, um, Scarface, and Beanie Siegel. Mm-hmm. And um, obviously before that, been in love with music, listening to music, mm-hmm. writing songs, writing... I used to write their reggae songs. My dad was like a mm-hmm. sound man, so mm-hmm. that's my like entry point, like mm-hmm. dancehall and reggae and whatever. Mm-hmm. And then um, I just... There was this uh, uh, particular verse on this song... Mm-hmm. It was Scarface's verse, but it was just how he was talking about something that was happening in real time. Mm-hmm. And it just it just made me view my approach of writing lyrics differently because it was my lyrics were always about what I'd done last month, last year, five years ago, whatever, mm-hmm. or what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. But in his verse, he was talking about something that just happened just then, and I I didn't know you could do that. Right. It was like, yeah. sounds like a stupid thing to say, but I was like, rah. He said, as I walked into the studio to do this with Jig, he got a phone call. He heard it uh, from his friend Reese. They just lost one of his kids, and when he heard that, he just broke into tears. And I was just like, rah, that literally just happened now, and you're saying it now. Mm. 
And I was just like, wow, that's powerful. Like, it just opened my mind to be like, you don't always need to be forward thinking or past thinking. You can literally be in the present. And right. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's have a listen yeah. to this moment. Sorry for the abrupt thing. <laughs> You're the DJ. Yeah, sorry. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, no, I'm, consci I, I'm conscious of time, and this is not. Um, this is okay. It's going to be slightly. It's going to be slightly clunky. So my apologies. Um, so moving on to you, you. Um, so what was a song that, that changed things for you and made you want to to make music? Um. Well, I was very blessed to have parents had great taste in music and were always playing music in the house and exposed me to like Bob Marley and Whitney and, <laughs> all right, hello. <laughs> um, yeah, just being exposed to like a wealth of great music. And, but of course, like in that time it was MTV, it was VH1. And so I feel like everyone's first image of music that's from this point in time was the Jacksons. And it was gonna yeah. be Michael and Janet when I saw the screen video. Mm. And I feel like that song in particular, for me, was able to mesh everything I love about music as far as, like, the visual point of view, mm. first of all, mm. and the production by Jam and Lewis, who are, like, my favourite producers of all time. Mm. And then the song being, like, Michael and Janet and just, like, the arrangement and the dynamic. And I remember being a kid and being like, what's that sound that's going... Ding, 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 ding. Mm. And, like... <laughs> Yeah, you, I, I didn't have the words for it then, but I recognised that as like a very pivotal moment of like listening to music and being like, how did that happen? Right, okay, interesting. So, well, let's listen to it. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to pick mine again, man. My video was dead. <laughs> <laughs> That video was yeah. fun. No, no. But, you know, but to, to, be fair, to be fair, like, probably at the time, like, no one could compare with the Jacksons yeah, yeah. at yeah. the time. So, um, we'll, 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 we'll make allowances for you on that. Um, um, yeah, so, ju so, just talk, really sort of talking about song, songwriting even further, um, I just want to ask what songwriters inspired you? Um, and why is it important to acknowledge songwriters? So, all right, Shazne, why don't we start, we'll start with you. I can't think, I don't, I mean, I was so in my own bubble as a writer that I don't mm -hmm. really, and actually going back to what you were saying earlier, I grew up on reggae music. So actually, <coughs> actually Bob Marley, Bob Marley mm -hmm. inspired me as a writer mm -hmm. because that was the first, my first introduction to music. I just as a, as a six-year-old obsessed and would play his records and harmonize to them. Mm -hmm. So, and funny enough, a few years ago, I went to watch the play and it really moved me. And I think what moved me was just the fact that what Marley was singing about then is so still relevant Today. now. Mm -hmm. And just the power in his messaging and, and will still be, it, th those messages will still be a thing long after we're gone. So actually I'll say Marley, I'll say Bob Marley. I don't, I, even though I'm a pop writer, mm -hmm. but I feel an emotional connection to his writing. Okay, amazing, amazing. Um, Chisara. Um, definitely. Definitely Bob Marley as well. Um, but also, I think I was trying to find a way to write music that was considered protest music, but you could dance to it. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so I was looking at Bob Marley, I was looking at Fela Kuti. Mm. I was like, he wrote about the Nigerian army, but everyone wants to dance and also call them zombies. Yeah. Mm. It's like, how do you disseminate a message with feeling and with the depth of the meaning of the message and the gravity of it, while also creating a community, creating a party, creating a rhythm. Mm -hmm. But I think that also links back to the exhibition in that I love rhythm, I love West African rhythm, and Naibingi rhythm, and Bob Marley's music with the Whalers, and just how we're reaching back into the African diaspora, reaching back to Africa yeah. to send messages through rhythm and through drums. Mm -hmm. um, so I think 
although I was writing a lot of guitar songwriting, singer-songwriter things, I was trying to find that link back to how I was going to connect to that part of myself. And those artists, and including like Michael Jackson's they don't really care about us. It was like yeah. Brazilian, then you have mm. the drums again. So I was just like, it's mm. the drums. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, that's mm. clearly yeah. part of it. So I think yeah. that really had a great impact on how I was going to produce my music when it became more than just me on a guitar or how I was going to play. Like I play instruments in a very rhythmic way for myself. And um, mm. yeah, that really inspired me to make. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, and Rich? For me, a lot of, a lot of reggae, Obviously, Bob was um, always, 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 always playing through the speakers in my house. I think like Garnet Silk, Dennis Brown. <laughs> <laughs> you on the mic? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Garnet Silk, Dennis Brown, <laughs> Beres Hammond. I think just like all of the feels. Like I, I, I realized like I, I liked a narrative or a concept. Like, or just like the way someone would say something. So Garnet Silk saying, you're barely full, but they're starving. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I always was yeah. trying to understand, what, what do you yeah. mean by that? And why did you say it like that? And mm -hmm. I think just so much, mm. all the different rooms in my house are playing different genres. So my mum's listening to Karen White, early in the morning, mm. I go <laughs> But like, that song there, when I'm listening to that song, I'm like, right, that's a story. Mm. Right. Like, it's a whole thing. Yeah. Like, it's not just... Yeah. Lyrics, as I said, falling in love with so much different styles of writing, and then obviously like Nas, <coughs> mm. Biggie, just like how they're telling their story and it's rhyming and then the cadence and the pattern and how can, how you can you can take someone through a journey with just how you're moving your voice and yeah. mm -hmm. just how the beats, just how you're you're, you're riding on the rhythm and yeah. whatnot. So mm -hmm. just different, loads of different genres to be honest. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Wonderful. And then Emily K. I feel like I'm about to sound real lame in next to you guys. <laughs> because, like, you know, I obviously I grew up with Bob Marley and, like, you know, that uh, obviously there being a deeper message to the songs and there being a place to come from. Mm -hmm. If anything, I feel like I'm in that point right now where I'm having the music now have a deeper purpose than just yeah. writing a song. Because yeah. I came into it as just such a fan of music. Yeah. And so. I grew up, you know, in the early 2000s and where it was very much about Dark Child and Timberland and mm. um, Scott Storch, uh, Jermaine Fire Dupree. Though, yeah, you I mean... You said it like it was no, going to be... but I say that, it's, but, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but yeah. think about it, it's all American. <laughs> yeah, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all black American and, you know, that was where I was getting, like, the source of my favourite black music, yeah. you know what I mean? Mm. As far as, like, British songwriters or even that side of thing, mm. I was looking to people like you know, Brian Higgins and, like, you know, all, everyone who was making that type of, like, pop music that was really huge in this country. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, but then that all came from a point of view of melody and structure, almost having, like, a science to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there almost be maths to it. It takes... It's, it's something that's so fun to me and instinctual, but there's, like, there is a metric to it. Mm. And people like Brian Higgins, Max Martin, you know, when you listen to that type of music, that there is like a, a scholarship to almost. Mm. Mm. No, no, good, um, good point. Yeah. I don't know. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, um, what was a song that you feel most proud of writing or participating in? Um, and we're going to play some more music. Yeah. Shazne. Um, I'll say Pure Shores. Thanks for agreeing, guys. Thanks for agreeing. Um, and I think purely because, same, I agree with you, where I came up listening to, to different genres of music. I grew up on reggae, but then listened to a lot of pop, America's Top Ten, The Chart Show, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But then also was into hip-hop. I was, I was into beats. And so I was quite... I think I was quite closed in the kind of way I wanted to write and the kind of music I wanted to write to, bearing in mind that I'm from London, mm -hmm. Caribbean country, so it's not, it wasn't just straight up American music that I wanted to write. It had mm -hmm. bits and bobs of everything. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I wrote Pure Shores with William Orbit, 
that was the first time I'd sort of written with somebody that was outside of the kind of person that I would naturally gravitate to writing with. Mm -hmm. And it actually taught me a lot. It actually opened up my eyes. And um, I then sort of, I think, looked at songwriting in a completely different way, like kind of elevated, I'd say, mm -hmm. and learned to understand that although I listened to certain types of music, that I wanted to be able to write for everybody. I, I, that was always there, but it, mm. it was never at the surface. So I think the first, when I wrote Pure Shores, it definitely opened up my eyes to writing for a wider audience. And, you know, I mean, look, 25 years later, mm -hmm. I can still listen to that song. And, I'd say. And that means a lot to me. Facts. Because when you get to our age, you start <laughs> thinking about legacy. You start yeah. thinking about what you leave behind. and mm -hmm. So that's one song that I'll say I'm quite happy to leave behind. Wonderful. Big let's, tune. Let's, uh, let's listen. I think we can safely say that that is a banger. Bless <laughs> um, Chisara. So I didn't know we were going to play a video, um, but... <laughs> ah, surprise. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> the song I chose uh, was a song quite early on in my writing when I was starting to produce more for myself. Um, so it's not necessarily... For me, the best song I've ever written, but it's a really good example of going from trying to write songs as, like, inspired by Tracy Chapman, Jeff Buckley, trying to write songs in that way, and then mm -hmm. also threading an experiment in jazz, an experiment in, in drums and percussion. It was just a way for me to spread out and... Is that me or something? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> spread out and feel like I was making stuff that I wanted to hear. Um, so, yeah, it's like right at the start of that ev evolution. Wonderful. I just put that one in. Let's listen. <laughs> <laughs> So we've, um, oh, we, we, we seem to be speeding ahead, conscious of time here. So um, I'll just move on to, um, let's, let's talk about a song that got you, that, that was significant in life, that either got you through something significant or was just significant um, uh, in life. And uh, for this one, I'm going to start with me. Oh, yeah. gonna, selfishly, I self, <laughs> selfishly, I need to, selfishly, I need to join in. <laughs> um, and I would say that a song that was significant for me, because I, I started work about 25 years ago. Mm. That was when I started working in the music business. Mm. I started doing, I was, um, started doing like street team promotions and then club promotions and then went into, and then went into A&R. Mm. Right? Um, and it was more, it was, it was kind of just more of a, it was more, my attitude to it was kind of just more of a, well, I'm quite sure I know what a hit record sounds like. With actually no idea of how it happened, mm. but I was just like, I can pick the, the, the songs, right? And then, um, uh, my brother called me, my brother called me one, uh, one day and said to me, have you heard this, this tune called, uh, it's this tune called Dilemma, right? Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's just one long bass line. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I heard it, but what do you want me to do with this, right? And he's like, no, no, you need to take this seriously, these, these guys seriously. And it was, it would end up being the So Solid crew. Mm. Yeah. So, so I remember going to meet them in, in I, mean, I remember going to meet them, in, they're all from Battersea, so I remember going to meet them in Battersea. <laughs> I met Mega Man and basically had a, uh, had a conversation with him about like, you know, what's the plan here? What's the big idea? What are you trying to mm. ultimately try and achieve? And he's, the way he explained it to me, it was so clear. You know, such big ambitions. It was uh, it, in my head. I was like, I've never heard anybody say anything like this before. Mm. But I can't think of a reason why this isn't possible, mm. right? And so, yeah, you know, we put out uh, their first single. We put out is this record called Oh No, um, 
and stuff. And it, it was a hit record, but it kind of created so much excitement about them. And of course, they're a big crew, there's like 30 people in it. Mm. They came to me and said, we want to have a song with all of the MCs on it. And I laughed. <laughs> and, I, and I just said, well, as long as you can do it in three and a half minutes, yeah. which, was the, which was the, at that time, was the length of a, a radio edit, the songs that we played on the radio. Right? I said, as long as you can do it three and a half minutes, fine. Mm. Right? And that was me thinking I was politely saying no. <laughs> um, and then they went off and divided three and a half minutes by 10 and came up with 21 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the truth. That is the absolute truth. <laughs> so, and, it's a, and it was significant for me because it was like, I think in my life, or in my life in, in a, or my career in A&R, I've been like, but I've been like really successful for a long time, for a long time. Mm. But I think that moment was where I think the, the cultural significance of it. Yeah. I don't, I don't even think I realised what the significance mm. of it was at, at the time. So I think that's kind of one of my proudest moments of my career. Mm. Mm. Oh, so let's listen to it. I hope that I hope, please. Yeah. <laughs> It sounds, like, it sounds like a few of you know, know, know the song. We were trying to reserve ourselves. We were trying to maintain some decorum in this place. <laughs> Funny enough. <laughs> OK. <laughs> well... The song um, that got you through something significant in your life, or was significant in, 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 in life career for you? OK. Yeah. Well, bad following that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well... I don't know if anyone knows, <laughs> but I'm kind of gay. <laughs> <laughs> no shit. Right? I was, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I just wouldn't, whatever. It's, I don't make a thing, but like one. <laughs> basically, me kind of growing up in Catford, in Lewisham, like that was. <laughs> There's always a South London. There is. <laughs> <laughs> there is. Um, yeah, I mean, the environment didn't uh, encourage me to feel comfortable with... Um, beyond even coming up, I don't want to give it that much power. It's even more just exploring or knowing that there's other people like myself yeah. in an environment. Because, you know, sometimes in school, you're just feeling like, OK, it's got to be, like, mm. stiff off an upper lip and stuff. Mm. And so then I go into the industry and that opened my eyes up to just like other people outside of the my radius, you know what I mean? And I was also growing in this industry. I got into the industry when I was 14, mm. like during like really formative years of me discovering who I am and I'm supposed to be helping other people discover who they are through music as well. Yeah. Weird I call it me, but <laughs> nevertheless. Uh, so I was 18 and I was um, working a lot with Rudimental and Black Butter around that time. And it was becoming, I was about to turn 18, so I was now going to be like clubbing legally and stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. I've always, been a, I've always been a big kid, so I could get away with it, but we ain't going to get into that. It's fine. I, I was now starting to club, and I was starting to make dance music with Rudimental and with people under Black Butter and et cetera, et cetera. And I worked with Gorgon City for the first time. And around that time, they had like a song with Yasmin, um, We Used to Be. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that was like mm -hmm. huge in the clubs. And I was like, okay, cool. We, we're getting the students together. And Ready for Your Love was the mm -hmm. first song we'd written. And it was like really, I don't know, it was really quick to write because it was exactly how I was feeling then. I was feeling very comfortable to be out and proud and comfortable to give love, to receive love, to be exactly who I was. Mm. But I was still able to like mask it in a way that you guys could understand. Mm. Um, <laughs> and yeah, like, but, but for me, that's like my coming out song. You know, that yeah. was the, the song that permitted me to feel <laughs> like I could do the rest of my career and do it properly and honestly and not with any type of 
taper of my mouth, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, ready for your love. Okay. However. Oh, okay. We've got another one. <laughs> <laughs> oh. mm. I mean, what? <laughs> I mean, we could talk about that one, but I don't know if that, like... Well, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh. Okay, well, the other song in particular <laughs> <laughs> that I've been so politely probed by Glenn to mention. Um, well, yeah, Head and Heart with Joe Curry was a record that came out during the pandemic. It was a really hard time for a lot of us. And I think that me being even sent that song during such a time where I didn't know what the hell was going on. I didn't know where I was supposed to be at, how I was supposed to be. But all I knew was that I'd received this MP3 of this record. And I listened to it and it was undeniable. I was like, well, no one's singing this book. Me, first things first. <laughs> and then, secondly, I was just like, okay, we have to finish this and we're releasing it during a time when we're not really supposed to be doing like, music videos or, you know, success isn't really guaranteed because it's just like, we're all yeah. in the, we're all question mark, dot, dot, dot. Mm. I like to say. Uh, but the song helped me through the pandemic as far as just there being something that was like, great. Mm. I, uh, I was feeling disillusioned as far as like my artist career and me being like the face of what I do. Mm -hmm. And it was quite nice to get like my first number one single during a time when I couldn't really be touring the world to promote or anything. But at the same time, it was like, it was a cool moment during the pandemic to have like a hit record and to, and to share it with people and to make people happy during that time mm -hmm. of the question mark dot dot dot, as aforementioned. <laughs> um, yes. Wonderful. Let's uh... okay. <laughs>
You look like you have some thoughts on this. <laughs> um, I can have thoughts. Um, okay, specifically, I guess, is for me, genres, mm. especially within the context of black music. Mm. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of times, like, black music is these things. Yeah. Mm. Whereas even going to this exhibition and just knowing our, <coughs> our history, it's most things. It's nearly all things. Yeah. yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, and so I found trying to nav I still find trying to navigate that conversation. Mm. When I was trying to find places to play, they were like, send your music, we'll play, we play all black music, like R and B, soul and hip hop. Mm. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh that's not that's not the whole story. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I I still feel like we're kind of there. In, in, in that we're repeating that, but there's been so much Chesney, Emonique, indie music, these black pop stars coming through, especially in the UK, yeah. like writing new stuff. And I think it's encouraging to see that those boundaries are expanding and that we're able to transgress all of those lines without having to say, and now I'm doing this thing, but actually it's just a continuation of our practice and of our story, mm -hmm. and that we're able to find ourselves within all music because that's the history of it. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that, okay. no, I mean, <laughs> I was, yeah. I'm waiting for more. Yeah, I mean, this no, is I'm fantastic. Just, I'm no, excited. Mm -hmm. I'm excited that that is expanding on a on an artist level. But then I also think now institutionally that needs to be reflected. Mm. So we need radio stations going. This isn't just what black music is. No. Mm -hmm. You know, we need all awards representing that. We need that whole conversation so that generation after generation they go. Actually, I can be anywhere. And there's only like for my my upbringing was very much you can do you can find yourself anywhere you're there mm -hmm. your people are there but I don't think everyone gets to feel that way and that's a very no. that's a very special thing to feel but if you can't see that how do you get that feeling if mm. I'm telling you about mm. it so I'm excited that we're able to see that and it's coming but I think it it needs those big heavy hitters also to be having the same conversation. Mm. Okay, excellent point. Mm. Um, in any case, I, I know, I know you, you definitely have some thoughts here. Don't make it a thing, Glenn. <laughs> it's not like that. <laughs> <laughs> what I will say is, though, <laughs> that... No, I, I think I, um, I echo a lot of your sentiments. Yeah. Um, just because I never came into this industry personally as, like, a R and b or hip-hop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. writer, act, anything. Of course, my influences come from there. Naturally, it's what you grow up with, but then being in this country or, you know, whatever, like, you can just absorb so much and make your own thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do think there's a limited um, scope for black British artists as far as what they can be, especially to black audiences. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Because... If every day black audiences are being fed that all they need to be listening to is R&B and hip hop, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And then how how can they know that you know uh, there are black artists who are making stuff that's like outside of that, yeah. or you know? And also, pop is a bad word amongst the black community, which I think is doing itself a disservice. Mm -hmm. um, so much of pop music is derivative of black music. Mm -hmm. uh, but they hear pop and it's so and it's so much a, a thing of whitewash, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, look, I I'm here like exec producing the flow album, and pop is the bad word, you know what I mean? Because you know, everyone wants to be credible and cool and an R and B and you know, what they don't realise is that they're making pop music. Mm. Mm. Whether they like it or not. As long if they're making music to be popular, to yeah. be absorbed by masses. You are not here talking about old R&B, SoundCloud, in the corner, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so uh, you know, just... <laughs> that's not what we're doing. We're, we're here, we're trying to make a major label moment. It's pop yeah. music. So, yeah. like, I think pop music needs to stop being a bad word in the black community, especially as someone who intentionally makes pop music, writing and as an artist, and, and one more thing. Um, I also don't feel like there's enough uh, black male or male at birth vocalists. Mm -hmm. okay. We, mm -hmm. we, are, mm -hmm. we are amongst loads of rappers, talk singers, mm -hmm. people who can't really breathe without auction. Like... <laughs> 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 
Guys, <laughs> guys, that's not shade. You guys are watching it. <laughs> it's there, it's there. You know what I mean? So it's like, I feel like we're missing the vocalist. Like, apparently, it's, maybe it's too wet to be singing and vocalizing and ad living. Mm. You know what I mean? But I'd like to hear someone give me a little riff and run. You know, and that's from here and, and this skin tone and. Maybe it doesn't have to do R&B. It could be anything, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be so limited and in the box. Um, all right. Do you feel like following that up? I agree with your sentiments. I think, I think what's great about being a black British artist is that we actually naturally before we went through the era of copying the Americans, we've always kind of had our own mm. thing. I think mm. that comes from where our parents come from, us being born here. So there's always been an influence of many different things, which I think we've kind of been able to cultivate and mm -hmm. make our own. I mean, we have artists like, you know, Joan Armour Trading. We've got people like Grace Jones. There are black mm. artists that <laughs> are making music that aren't R&B, that aren't, mm -hmm you know, these genres that we are sort of meant to to be aligned with and actually are quite inspiring. And I think we should not forget artists like that and and, and recognize that we are actually our own, we're our own thing mm. outside Amazing. of these genres. Mm -hmm. Amazing, I couldn't agree more, couldn't agree more. Um, so now I think just looking at time, I think it's probably a good time to open, open up to the floor for some questions. And stuff. If, any, okay. if anyone's got some questions in the room, and then some on, uh, there'll be some questions online. So let's let's start with some questions in in in, in the room. As soon as you've got the mic and the guys right next to you, Hello. let's start there. Hi, good night. Thank you for such a great panel and great discussion. Um, I'm an LGBT activist from Trinidad and Tobago, <laughs> and uh, for the last quarter of a century, we've been fighting against murder music through that dance hall, you know, that advocates for the murdering of LGBT people in the Caribbean. What does the panel have to say about how do we change that narrative? How do we change that music? How do we move away from that dark energy within our music in the Caribbean? Mm. Mm. I mean, so that's, a, that's a great question. Is that something that you would like to, to tackle? Well, I mean, as someone who's not from the Caribbean, and, and I'm Nigerian, where it's, it all, again, it's just like a lot of the countries we grew up from are, have always told us, like, no, mm -hmm. it can't be this way. Um, who actually knows the way in which to combat it when it's mm. so prevalent and so, like, um, recurrent in our industry? Um, even beyond that, even, like, there's always going to be some type of, like, cloak of... Uh, you know, uh, homophobia in, mu in music, where there's like institutions telling you, okay, this is what sells. This is not what we want to be seeing. I mean, I, and we've grown up with that music. I know that I grew up even as a boy from South London hearing this music and you're hearing Batty Boy and all sorts of just like derogatory <laughs> language mm. that is just used flippantly. You're not even censoring that. You'll censor shit and, and fucking all that, but we won't be censoring like the real stuff that's actually harming someone and making them feel small about themselves. Yeah. Um, I've said what to say. I ain't got the answer, but I feel you wrong. Mm. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Uh, where's the where's the where's ah oh, there he is there. Um, there's a chap here. There's a chap here with the uh, with the white t-shirt and sunglasses. Hi. Um, with lyrical kind of changes and music in Britain becoming darker by the day, and that seems to be what's popular at the moment, mm -hmm. how can we transition young people getting into music to kind of move away from such violent lyrics mm -hmm. and into something that uplifts the black community as opposed to contributes to his downfall? Mm. Oh, well, that's, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Yeah. It's, also quite a, it's also a controversial one because <clears throat> in, my, in my experience of 
particularly, I remember when signing the So Solid Group, I kind of had these, 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 de these debates, right? And, you know, I'm talking from a record company perspective, is that I'm not necessarily, beyond a certain, past a certain point, I'm not there, I'm not there to censor anybody or tell people what to say, right? And if, if that's what, my view is that if that's what they're expressing, I'm taking, I'm taking it that that is what their experience is. And they're talking about their, <coughs> it's particularly with them, and they're talking about their actual lived experience. Mm. So is that, is, is that a question about the art itself, or is that a question for wider society? Like, why are these, why are these people experiencing these things? Mm. Growing up in London, mm. growing up in London, right? And I think, um, because, I think with because I, I, I think with, I think great art is supposed is, is is supposed to inspire conversation, um, and I think that what we also what we look for in great art is is a, somebody an individual or a group of people's perspective and their version of the truth. So that's kind of so I come at it from that point of view, look at it like that, that way, and it's like well if this is their, if this is their truth, why and whose fault is this? Mm. Do, you, do you see what I mean? So, and that's and and. I don't, so rather than, and people will always accuse us of, well, you're just exploiting, you're exploiting this for money, but then well, I'm like, you need to look at this the other way, you know? <coughs> Actually, we're highlighting, this is, the, this is highlighting a much larger problem mm. for society that we all need to deal with. <coughs> That's what I think. That's what I think. Mm. Anybody else got any thoughts on that? I think as well that like, we just have to hope that there's growth. Mm. Mm. And I say that to say, like, if you go back to, I don't know, early Soul Solid, if you go back to early Gets, if you go back to early Dizzy Rascal, there is a lot of them speaking about the environments mm -hmm. that they was in, mm -hmm. what it was like, what it looked like, what it felt like, what was happening. But then if you fast forward now and you listen to a Gets or Swiss from Soul Solid or... Mm -hmm. The, the lyrical content has moved on and the person has grown mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's reflecting in the music. Mm -hmm. So now you're hearing Gets with a record called Proud Family where mm -hmm. he's talking, do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's completely different context and content. So mm -hmm. I think when the individuals grow, mm -hmm. they grow out of certain content because they move out of the environment. Mm -hmm. Of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, but obviously the key word I use is hope because there are some that are still going to be whatever age and speak, whatever they feel is, is true to them. So I just say that I just hope that there's growth in the person, because then that reflects in the music. Okay. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else get any thoughts, or should we have another question? OK, we'll have another question. Um, a chap in the orange shirt there. Orange. Pink? I think it's pink. Uh, it looks orange. It looks orange. <laughs> Maybe I'm it's kind mind. of like a, a salmon thing, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but I reckon it's the light you know, it's just changing the shirt colour and everything. Right. Um, so, okay. I've been around like a thousand years, and so, just yeah. like, one of the things that really strikes me is how much black Britishness has changed, mm -hmm. how many different elements of that has Mm -hmm. But for me, what really was striking was listening to like Give a Little Love by um, Omar, of course, mm. and Misha Paris, and uh, that bass line. That isn't, that, isn't that song called Should Have Known Better? Should Have Known yeah. Better. Yes, good, yeah. Should Have Known Better. So, yeah. Sorry, mm. Should Have Known Better, yeah. So, um, I was just thinking, because just bouncing what Shazni was saying, um, about we pick up everything. Apart from yourselves, who do you feel like? is doing that fusion of that different style, pushing the boundaries of what black music can be, bringing maybe like different elements of like, we're now like it's very much African Nigerian community as well as Caribbean. Who do we feel are like pushing those boundaries of what our black British sonic voice is? I'm just gonna say off the top of my head, I've forgotten her name, is it Ash? Ash, Ash Nico? No, oh. White. Shaney. Shaney, sorry. She's trying so hard to just be her, do her thing, be British with all these other influences that she's probably not supposed to, you know, be. And I really, mm. 
I really rate that because yeah. it's hard. It's hard for black British. Do you know, you know who I'm talking about? Shaney? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never heard of him. Have you? Shaney White. Shaney White, yeah. Mm -hmm. Off the top of my head, that's one well, person today. I can mm -hmm. think of. She's <laughs> trying really hard to, you know, be true to herself and stay in mm. the lane of where she's influenced by many different things. And I think that's really refreshing for, mm -hmm. for being a, you know, a young black British female mm. artist. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Sampha as well, I'd say. Yeah. I think yeah. it treads a good line of... Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, another question there. Uh, okay, we'll have, one, we'll have one question online and then we'll come, then we'll come to you, Michelle. Uh, okay, so, so uh, mm -hmm. online question is, mm -hmm. well, there's two questions actually uh, for Chesney. Would you ever consider teaching a one or two day songwriting or poetry course? Ah. Yeah, that's going to be my idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I'll just throw one straight at you, another one. Um, which artist or style of music are you listening to right now? What's on your playlist? Mm. Somebody here really likes you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can Darren I, and Rebecca. Ah, uh, yeah. I know those guys. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I can't think about what I what I'm listening to at the moment. I'm listening to many different things. But I mean, the poetry. I actually started. My love for writing started from poetry. My right. my headmistress. She covered an English lesson at school, and she taught poetry. And that was the first time that my ears pricked up in class. And I just became obsessed with with words and what you could do with them. And mm -hmm. you know and and I started, yeah, writing poetry, and that turned into writing songs. So I was doing that way before I was singing. I was actually writing songs without even thinking about being a singer, mm. but just loved writing songs. So, yeah, I probably, I probably would get involved in something like that. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, right, another question in the room. I know Michelle was, like, sitting on the edge of the seat. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing panel, guys. I, I wanted to know, what is the most consistent part of your practice that you've carried throughout your career? And does it translate into any other part of your life? Mm, that, is an interest, that is a really a interesting one. question. Um, um, I mean, I guess for me, it's kind of um, actually quite boring because I'm like an executive. <laughs> so... Um, I guess the most consistent, well, the most consistent part of my thing is actually listening, listening to lots and lots of different music. And mm -hmm. what I've learned to do is, I, I sort of went through a period of like listening to music and trying to analyze everything, analyze it all the time. And so now, instead of, instead of trying to analyze it, I just listen to it and like, do I enjoy this? Mm -hmm. First and first and foremost. Mm -hmm. and I'll get to the analysis part later, but like, literally every morning I'll be listening to some new piece of music mm. uh, and that's kind of that's um, and it's sort of I guess it's because it's my job but it's like it's, it's, all, it's almost like it's taken over my life because that's, that's just what I do at work at home all the time it's just become a habit but but it but I kind of but it's great because I'm actually a fan of music I really love I really love music and I mm. think making it about in, be, enjoying it is, is, it becomes less about work then. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, that's what that's how I, that's what I would say. I mean, I think obviously when I'm writing for other people, I tend to trust my gut a lot more. As in, it's very much, yeah, that sounds good. Do it. Do you know what I mean? And even when it comes down to, um, I started my own label, Muse by Uzo. And um, Tyler Lewis, who's on the label, just released her first EP <laughs> today. Congrats, congrats, so, congrats, yeah. congrats, 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 congrats. I mean, you don't need to stream it, please yeah. do. Available um, in all, 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 all DSPs. <laughs> but I think so much of that is like, okay, it's easy to be like, okay, no. Mm -hmm. No, that doesn't work, scratch it, you know? But then I'm also a recording artist in my own right, and trusting my gut sometimes is like a, yeah, I don't know. You just kind of, you don't always do that. 
No. You always second guess, so you always like think, okay, maybe no one's trying to hear this. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it's um, I think that's one. I, I'll say that I don't apply that to another part of my life, but the gut instinct is something I want to carry on through everything that I do. That really matters to me. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Um, for me, <coughs> I think it's just I've always like try to pull apart my sentences like in my verses in my raps especially like just trying to make sure that I thought about every way this could be said and it's like have I said it before and and I and I'm just so fascinated with things of like how sometimes one word in a sentence makes something feel more emotional or it makes it feel more impactful or less impactful and I always look for them little words that could be different to make the listener feel exactly what I'm trying to get across. So if I want emotion, I want the word that, cool, that's, that's the one that feels the best within this sentence. And I'm like, proper, I've always been like that. Like, is it worded right? Is it worded right? Mm-hmm. Not, not, as, not in, a, like, in a bad way, like I'm second guessing, but I'm just like, I just want to make sure that it's, my, my best foot is always put forward lyrically. Mm. Like, I don't want you to hear a verse mm. and think, well, I don't know, what's he on? Like, I want you to know that, now nah, this boy, when he's going to rap, this ain't no joke. Like, he's really thought this through thoroughly. Like, mm. they're, 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 them words are going to outlive me tenfold, you know what I'm saying? So I just want to make sure... Oh, thank you. <laughs> I didn't even see where that came from, but no, no. <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, basically, yeah. Chisara, any thoughts on that? Um, I think someone asked me a similar question once, and I think, like, practice. When I think about the process of making and being in that flow, for me, it's like being able to dream at night. I'm a really big dreamer, mm. so... Mm. As in, like, sleeping and dreaming. <laughs> I don't know, it's, by the way, it's like we're all working in the music business. We're all dreamers, we're all, by, yeah. we're all dreamers by default. <laughs> and I think that the aspect of, like, sleeping and then being like, um, what do you call it? Um, lucid dreaming, yeah. So like having all those experiences and thinking through thoughts and pasts and ideas that have come through, actively doing that. I feel like when I, I'm in a cycle of dreaming and dreaming, mm-hmm. I'm at my best, most open state to make things mm-hmm. and not feel precious about it, mm-hmm. but just let whatever I'm processing through and, and create. Um, maybe that's just a combination of being very aware of like my well-being and my mental and physical, as well as the tools of making stuff. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay. Wow. Wow. Great. <laughs> Deep. <laughs> <laughs> Shazna, you want to add to that, or I'm not sure we have another question. Um, I think really, probably, I'm all with being in it for so long. I'm still excited now, mm. as I was in the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think making, go, going with your gut and also doing things that feel good for the soul is what probably maintains that excitement. And mm-hmm. I carry that through music, through writing, mm-hmm. through who I work with, through who I, people that I meet. I mm-hmm. think it all kind of comes together and, yeah, helps with... I've lost my trail of thought, guys, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it helps with what I'm doing. I just, it's always about keeping the excitement. I mean, I, after 30 odd years of being in the industry, I'm still just as excited now as I was in the very beginning. And I don't ever want to lose that. Mm, I don't ever no, want to lose amazing. being excited about mm. whoever I collaborate with and, and, and how things are going to sound once they're put together. Mm-hmm. I'm still just as excited about that now as I was then. Fantastic. Well, uh, another question. Is there an, hold on, before you, do, before you pass the mic, is there another question online? No, I think we're good. Okay, cool, so... <laughs> hey, everybody here's a comedian, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we're all in the wrong profession, you know. <laughs> um, this has been a great panel. I'm actually not from the music industry, so this is really insightful for me. Um, I work in women's health, shameless plug. Um, <laughs> firstly... Shazne, I just want to give you your flowers. Like, mm. seeing someone that looks like you on TV when I was, like, eight 
nine helped me see possibility. Um, mm. So I just want you to know that. And I think I can attest for all the other brown skin women in the room that that was really important. I appreciate um, it. Yeah. Chizara, your listening to your song today was worth the technical glitch. <laughs> <laughs> that's a banger. Um, so that's, that's what I want to say before my question. But my question's more like a life question. So what advice have you all, and this is for all of you, Glenn included, like what advice have you all got in your life that on reflection you actually wouldn't give to someone else? Oh. I'm a oh. journalist. <laughs> You know what? This, you know what? This, this funny. That's a great question, actually, and it kind of this sort of relates to you know what what, what Emily K was saying about following your instincts, right? Because mm -hmm. the other side of that so solid crew story, right, is that is, it was they were like I was new to doing A and like new in the music business, so I kind of I remember talking to an older executive, someone who was you know who was kind of introduced to me as someone of like real experience and had been really successful, right? So you, you kind of, you know, when you speak to those people and kind of get their advice or or um, or get their point of view, you, you, you kind of, you, you sort of believe more of it than perhaps you even should, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I remember talking to him about the Sociology crew and he basically said to me, 30 black kids from a council estate is never going to work. Right. And, but luckily for me, I was like, my sort of whole point of view was that once I was sure something was going to work, you just couldn't convince me otherwise, right? Even if I was wrong, <coughs> even if I ended up being wrong, but you just couldn't convince me otherwise. So in the end, I thought to myself, yeah, I hear it, but he's old, what does he know? And carried on, <laughs> and, car and carried on. So I think that to, to your point about following your instinct, you should always listen to your first instinct because nine times out of ten it will be right or it will guide you the right <coughs> way, I think. And that's been my and that's just been my experience of working in the of working in the business and our, our artists I've signed, you know, and particularly when it's gone well, I've always had the same feeling. I was just sure mm. it was gonna work. Whether I knew how it was gonna work or not, just had the feeling and that is what I followed. Mm. I I would even piggyback off of that. Mm -hmm. and, you know, just say, yeah, I mean, I've been an artist signed to a record label and I've been the head of a record label where I'm from both corner, both sides. And so I've been on the other side of being told I'm too fat or I'm too gay or I'm, my outfits are too, you know, um, political or whatever, you know what I mean? So... It's hard when you are young and you are in this industry and you are simply just trying to identify yourself. And it is um, hard when there's someone there telling you to dilute yourself or to make yourself more palatable for other people to feel comfortable with you. Um, I'm not at any position to be the person to tell someone that any artist I work with to dilute themselves just because I know how that feels and I know what that does to your mental psyche in the long run. Uh, it makes you feel like you're less than yourself. It makes you feel like you're not good enough and that everything that you do has to be some type of managed, manicured type beat. And mm -hmm. um, <coughs> I think it's right, especially for the new artists of today who should be allowed the scope to innovate and to not conform. Mm. Mm. Um, I think... I think the sentence the song needs to have <laughs> is. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I feel, I feel so bad. That you yeah, yeah, that. yeah, 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 um, yeah. I imagine what you're saying. That. Yeah, I think that. I think that sentence is probably not the greatest no. sentence to say to an artist. I think that isn't something. Well, I've tried not to say something needs to have, because it's expression, isn't it? Mm -hmm. and, there's, and, there's, and then there's always going to be an example, you're going to say that song needs a bridge. There's going to be an example of a record that's a hit without a bridge. The song needs a hook. Mm -hmm. There's going to be an example yeah. of a record that, not many, but doesn't have a hook that <laughs> yeah. still was, do you know what I'm saying, as impactful. So I think 
the song doesn't need to need anything. <laughs> it just need it just needs to be. It just needs to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't follow that because I, I agree and yeah. 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 Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, um someone told me that I should choose a practice specifically and just do that. Um, <laughs> and I just like I think it's relaying the instinct, relaying like not wanting to dilute your work and yourself. I have always done multiple practices. So I did a lot of theatre, did dance, tap dance, painting, acting. And I, I just felt like it wasn't just to do them. They just all felt like I needed to communicate in those different ways. But I think early on when I was meeting people in the industry, they'd be like, well, you could be a really good artist if you just focused on doing the... Specifically, it was like soul. They'd be a soul singer and do that. And it just it didn't sit right with me. And I think if anyone's telling you to choose without knowing you, mm. doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah. So yeah, that was the advice I wouldn't give to anyone. They have to make their own choice. Yeah. Mm. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. So, we, do we have do we have time for one more one more question? We've got one question online, and it may be time for one more in the room. Okay, well, let's have the question from online then, please. Um, this is Adam from Manchester. Uh, my question is, as artists cultivating identity is very hard, how did each of the panellists find making their first steps into making music, writing lyrics, and what moments really spurred you on to take even more steps? I'll hand over to the artists. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, well, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I think I am, God, all right. I think that, you know, the first, for me, it was always just the song first. Mm. And, you know, when I was in school and writing songs and, like, making beats and stuff and doing, all of that was really from a point of view of just, this is how I communicate. This is how I express myself. This is how I feel best understood. Um, I didn't love school. I didn't love home. I didn't really have like all like the best experiences um, outside of making music as a young person. Uh, but then of course, you know, being an artist next to just being someone who loves to make music is very two very different things. You know what I mean? When you're being an artist, there's so much more you have to think about. And it kind of goes back to what I was saying in my last answer, um, or rant. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I feel like there's... There is a lot of <laughs> thought that needs to come into when you're, you know, thinking about being the face of what you do. But then when you're mm. just writing and it's coming from a place of, mm. I'm helping you tell your story, mm. there's a pressure that's alleviated. Um, and, you know, I'm working on my own next project right now and I'm, I feel like I'm in the process of the question that's been asked of figuring out, you know, what lyrics I want to be saying, like, the perspective mm -hmm. I want to come from, who I'm trying to appeal to, like, what my purpose is as far as the music in general. Um, so it, it kind of goes to show that it never really ends. I'm sure that, you know, when you were making this new record, you were like, okay, what is the point of view I'm coming from. Like, this one, yeah. I didn't even have to think for the first time ever. Really? Yeah. I think, obviously, I did it <coughs> myself, so I didn't have an A&R to sort of have to... So tell, tell you what you need. Say, say, <laughs> say, what song, say what the song means. But also coming out of a group situation, so it was the first time that I didn't have to think about anything other than the song. Mm. I didn't have to think mm. about who had to sing it and how I needed those lyrics to be and how I needed that melody to be in order for that person to deliver it and how mm. I needed it all to be cohesive across sure. four people. And so this was probably the, the most, the first time that I didn't have to think, I just mm. wrote, which is what it should always be about. And it's taken me, the granny that I am, a long time, <laughs> to, a, a long time to get to that point. Mm. It's taken a long time and it's been, a revelation. It's been a lot of, uh, mm. yeah. So, um, yeah. But then there's all that other stuff that comes with it, like you say, afterwards about 
the stuff that we don't care about. We just kind of want to write great music yeah, and yeah. have people listen to it and all the other visual side of it all is and how, you know, yeah. the stuff that's not... At least not naturally, you know not, what I mean? Not naturally at the mm. top of the We understand that it, it goes hand in hand, but yeah, it's just about the song. It should always just be about the song. Sure. Always. Yeah. Okay, so one more question from the, uh, from the floor. Uh, when we before we wrap it up, um, who you going to pick? Me? Let's, 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 he's, he's, he's about look, that chap there. He's about to fall over the. <laughs> <laughs> he said exactly. I was going to get vexed if I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, well, you know, I, I, great, I, you know I sensed it. I sensed it. Yeah, <laughs> great, great panel. Um, I've heard of everybody apart from Chisara, and I'm going to be play in your songs all weekend. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. So um, the, the question from me is that the exhibition is about um, the last 500 years of black music. What I'd like to hear from the panel is what is your hope for black music in the next 500 years? And if that's too difficult, let's say the next 50 years. <laughs> but what, uh, what, what is much the hope, easier. What's the hope for, for black music? I, I want to... I want you guys to, to, to kind of give us some inspiration. <laughs> Why is everyone looking at me? <laughs> Go ahead, commence. Um, yeah, exec. Hmm? Go on, exec. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, look, I think that, you know, I think that, 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 you know, black music has always been vibrant and, and, and the, particularly the culture around it has always just been influential on, pop, on popular culture. Since I can, since I can remember, and I think it's always been, it's always been that way, and I think you know, and then we'll have periods of time where a particular, a particular style of the music becomes really, becomes re really popular. Um, you know, in the last few years, a few years we've seen like a dominance of UK rap music, right? um, which, which is something that I never actually thought I would see in my lifetime, um, because I remember like being a DJ going into record shops, and the debate was. You know, it was always about American rap music then, right? Mm. And there was the, always the debate in the record shop was like, wouldn't it be great if this happened here? You know, mm. it would happen here. And we would be like, we all would be like, yeah, it would be great, but it's never going to happen. Or it's a bit of a pipe dream. So to actually see it happen was just the most, was the most pleasing thing for me because based, based on those conversations. And I think that, so I think its vibrancy and its influence will just, will just continue forever forever and I hope that it and and it will continue to give the platform for great artists to come from so I don't even think we need to hope I think that's just going to happen mm. you, it, does that answer your question yeah, yeah. wonderful yes <laughs> um I just hope <laughs> that at least you know in this country as far as black music goes I really would love to see, yeah, just a more broad scope. Of course, there is great artists out there who are giving you all types of music, um, but I think I'd just want it to broaden, you know what I mean? And I think I'd love, I'd love to not feel like, okay, it's only this type of right. thing mm. that we are going to like allow to be seen as mm. black music. You know what I mean? Even if it's made by black people, even if mm. it's entirely made by black people for black people, mm -hmm. and because it's like one thing or whatever, like, mm. you know, I think the, the dream is for it to not be a monolith, you know what I mean? Mm. Mm. Having said that, right? Okay. You know, it's funny that I kind of answered that, I answered that, being a record company executive, mm. I kind of answered that question in the con in, with, from the context of what goes in the charts, right? And I think that the, the charts are kind of no longer the, the, the only uh, only thing, the only metric for success, mm. actually. So I think so. To your point about it not being monolithic, I think it is, uh, I think it isn't. But I think it just depends on how what we are dis what we're defining to be definitely. Success. Yeah, for sure, you know a point. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Impact. Hmm? Impact. Yes. Yeah, just yeah. some some level of impact, man. Mm -hmm. Something like special pieces of music, man. Do you know mm. what I mean? Like, I don't, I think as it gets bigger, like, you, you know, like stuff that's not good can end up in places by default. Mm. Mm. Like, I don't yeah. like that. Or like, yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah, when, yeah, you know, yeah. like when there's like 
certain situations and it's like, we need to hire two black people. Come. <laughs> like, you're not, but you know, like, you're not necessarily the best person for sure. the job. It's yeah. just like a, a, like a quarter fill. Yeah. yeah. Like, I don't want no quarter fill yeah. music. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I want yeah, it, yeah. everything is yeah. in whatever respective genre it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is the creme de la creme. Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, yeah. But even to what you're saying, like, mm. it's subjective. You know what I mean? Not all the best music in the world has the depth of like a well, as far as like but, but it's, context but, goes. But not, I mean? not, not, but Sometimes it doesn't need to be like, depth. It doesn't need to be depth. Yeah. It's just feel. Yeah. Feel. Do you know what I'm saying? Again, it's subjective. You know what I mean? Yeah. What you may consider like to be a real true banger mm. will not be someone else's mm. thing. But then I think the white music industry or like the pop industry gives you that leeway gives you that space to be like, hey, this is great, this is okay, but fun. If there's this mm. constant pressure for black artists to be great and impeccable and, you know, A star and all of this, mm. there's no way to appreciate all the different grades of what one can consider good or fun or, you know? Like, mm. I think that the black music can afford to have that breadth, but, um, you know, to what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but I still, that I still feel like we know what's rubbish, though. We know what's shit. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know, know what's rubbish. I'm just saying, no. <laughs> <laughs> that we know yeah, what, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm no saying. No one can tell us what's like, yeah, no yeah, yeah, amazing yeah, what's yeah. good, but what is rubbish? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. People that's, are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not that <laughs> one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but interesting, interesting <laughs> enough, though, right? Doesn't that actually just depend on what people are trying, are aiming for, mm. but what people want the outcome of it to be, right? Because it's like, I have this debate constantly, right? Okay. Mm. About, you know, and it's like, look, <laughs> in terms of like today, for to, just today, you know, the thing that, the, the, the TikTok has become a thing mm -hmm. that is probably the most single, most powerful promotional tool that exists, 100. right? Like beyond radio now, it's even it, it's it, you, you can't even question whether radio has the is as influential as it once was in helping people discover music. I think radio now sits in a place where it will make a big song bigger, but the thing becomes big because of because to be almost exclusively because of TikTok, mm -hmm. you know, some Instagram etc. And the et fifteen second clip. Yeah, but that's the, but that's what yeah. how it's how that's what TikTok whatever it's where houses right. So it's kind of like so and it's almost like if your mission is you want big hit records, big streaming hits and big chart hit records, mm. the tick you, tick you you have to factor that into your. I can't do that. Into I'm your sorry. thing. <laughs> But no, but that's but, but this is what yeah, but this, know, but is, but then, this is what this is this is yeah. this is kind of what it, yeah. this is what we this is seem seemingly like what what what. what but we're then facing. I suppose then you have to just do you and just do what feels right for your soul, mm -hmm. yeah. what feels mm -hmm. good for you. Because if you if you're you know I like I'm not that kind of person. I wouldn't even know where to begin. Right. Okay. And I can guarantee you that I might on paper be able to write something mm -hmm. that could work for that, but it definitely, most likely mm. wouldn't feel good for my mm. soul. But you know, but I actually think, it's like, but, I, but in, in, in spite of all I just said, right, I actually think... <laughs> now we're that, on the real panel. Yeah. <laughs> I actually think that, like, a banger still is a banger. That part, yeah, that part right. has not changed, yeah. right? Mm. Yeah. That part has not but changed. But there's, there's still somebody, though, that is saying, it's going to go on TikTok. Mm -hmm. It's good for TikTok. Mm. So you, well, the thing you is, that, but I that's mean? the but that's the the, the the putting the songs or putting music in front of people now. That's the part that's changed mm. quite significantly, mm. significantly over years and stuff. And like I said, it really kind of just depends on what you're trying to what you're trying achieve. to achieve. Right? Yeah. So if you're saying I want yeah. this to go to number one record, then your first stop is probably TikTok. Yeah. Mm. But if that isn't your if, it, yeah. if that isn't your thing, yeah, then, yeah, you, yeah. Does you do, then you do then you do something else. Yeah. And I think we have to. I'm always kind of having a conversation with, with people about you know, our teams. Uh, we have to just be clear about what we're yeah. actually trying to yeah. achieve here. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, and because not every artist has to, has, to, has to have number one records or yeah. big hits yeah. on the charts. You know? yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And I think it's, and then like constantly understanding that is you gotta important. Him, you got to keep him awake. Who? <laughs> Who? <laughs> <laughs> no, <Bonnie. laughs> come back. <laughs> Ignore me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. 
So, oh, oh no, was there another question, or are we just wrapping up? We're just wrapping up now. Well, we're wrapping up now. But look, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so, thank, thanks again to everyone here and online for joining us in conversation with the leading UK song, UK songwriters. Um, <laughs> Zara, Jazz Day, Rex, Emily Kay, thank you. Thank you for your time yes, for coming to share with everybody here. And hopefully for everybody who's been uh, here with us watch and, and, and who's been watching online, hopefully it was, uh, uh, it was interesting for you and educational and inspirational. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.